Phantoloids Podcast, here to tell you that we've teamed up with Vault Comics to help bring some of their creators a spotlight. Vault Comics, based out of Missoula, Montana, have been bringing some of the best fantasy, sci-fi, and horror comics to print since 2016. We're getting the chance to read some of their series early, and we're getting to discuss with the creative team the vision for their series. We're very happy to be collaborating with Vault Comics and sharing these number ones with you. Welcome to Exploring the Vault. Cue the intro. Panelites Podcast, Kyle here with Dimitri and Pierre and two very special guests, which I will have introduced themselves for clipping purposes. Hi, I'm Zach Kaplan. Hi, I'm John J. Pearson. The creative team of Mindset, that really cool vault book that you need to pick up and trade, but I'm going to let them tell you about it. But before we get into that, tell us about yourselves. You want to go first, John? No, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yes, about me. I'm Zach Kaplan. I'm a comic writer and creator. I've been making comics for about six, seven years. I write exclusively pretty much science fiction. I like to write kind of thought-provoking comics, and I've had about eight titles out so far and more in the works. I'm not new. I'm kind of still coming in. I feel new to comics a little bit, even though I'm kind of my lay of the land. Yeah, what else? I live in Los Angeles. I had been pursuing film and TV writing for a while. I went to school for that and then fell into comics and just loved it and kind of dove all in. And yeah, that's my story. Aquarius, like a good coffee. I don't know. John? I should go first. Like I said, my name's John J. Pearson. I'm also relatively new to comics. Mindset was my first creator-owned series that was kind of published internationally. I mean, I kind of got into comics by self-publishing in the UK, which is the route that a lot, if not all, people in the UK kind of get into comics. There's a thriving Indian self-publishing scene here. So I did a couple of series self-published. The main one was one called Beast Wagon about talking animals in a zoo and people kind of tripping out. Animal Farm on Acid, I think it was described as before. That was kind of one of the first things I did. Then I worked with Martin Simmons on his first kind of breakthrough series called Death Sentence, where I did art assists on him. So I've worked with No Martin for quite a long time. But the kind of main thing that was my supposed kind of breakthrough was working on blue and green so i colored graphic novel called blue and green by ram v and rk that came out on image and i won an eisen award for that alongside and and after that i did guest issue on to pop the truth I did some stuff for razor blades horror anthology as well then did a little bit of cool work for dc and batman urban legends and now we're here i'm firmly been dragged into comics now thanks to zach you're welcome i, I also teach comics in leeds in the uk so i'm a senior lecturer that I do a little lecturing on the side as well. Okay, very impressive. You didn't tell us your horoscope, but it's fine, you know. I'm a like cancer. It's my birthday coming up in July. And yet awesome. we get along. It's so interesting. I can get along with a cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know the like who does and doesn't get along, but someone listening can tell us if we're a good match. Aquarius, yeah, can't put it in the comments. Yeah, should they get together? Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> we made a book together. <laughs> so describe your routine: how often you write or draw, and then how many hours per day. That's a good question. Yeah, my professional routine. You know, it's interesting because that's kind of one of the things I've refined more and more as I have gotten into comics. I mean, I'm currently working on about five or six new series. And so being disciplined and having a really strict routine and regiment, I realized is kind of everything. So I'll pretty much try to get to my desk around 8.30 or so. I'll devote 30 to 60 minutes, any absolutely need to get out emails, anything that's super pressing or any social media posts, little kind of sharing and interacting on social media. And then kind of 9, 9.30 to 1, 1 1.30 is pretty much writing. I try to plug as much as possible and just get in a few good hours momentum and not be distracted by anything else grab lunch but i'll usually be writing through lunch then i'll save my afternoons for all the admin project management any phone calls or zooms i got to do with anyone really artists publishers retailers marketers you know podcasts interviews anything is kind of the afternoon is is for that so i'm trying to write about half my day and that's the thing that people who are making comics know but i think a lot of people who don't know that how much non-writing goes 
into making comics. There's a lot of creative collaboration, a lot of project management, a lot of kind of getting word out on your books to retailers, to readers, setting up conventions and all that. So yeah, I have a family and so I usually clock out right around dinner. No, it's a lengthy process. It's not just sit down, draw a couple pictures or write a couple sentences and you're good to go. I'm very organized and planned out as a creator. So it's definitely knowing kind of timelines and when John's going to need something, when he's going to be ready for pages, when he needs to talk about covers. It's just about kind of really understanding what's coming so that I'm preparing and I'm not caught off guard. That's a, a huge part of my day, just strategic planning on all the projects. Last year, I had four books come out. One was with Dark Horse, Dark Horse's Breakout, Scout Comics Forever Forward, Image Top Cow's Metal Society, and then Vault Comics Mindset. And then I have another five or six books coming out, almost all with different publishers, pretty oh, much. Well. But yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of the way you have to do it. I mean, the, the reality is, even if you find a publisher that is all in on you, that's willing to say, hey, Zach, let's make books, you and us in perpetuity, they're really only able to put out, you know, a book a year, realistically. I guess Image, maybe you're going to find a creator that does two books at Image, or maybe a creator that does two creator-owned books at Dark Horse. I think that if you find creators that are spreading, doing several creator-owned every year, it has to be at different publishers. That's just the way it works. For sure. So John, what's your day look like? There's not a standard day ever. It depends on what I'm working on, what deadlines I have, kind of how much planning I have to do. It's hard when it comes to doing the artwork because I'm just constantly doing it all the time because it is so time consuming. It'll be things like I'll try and get to the studio maybe around 10 in the morning after I've walked the dog and everything, but then I might be there until maybe eight, nine o'clock in the evening. And then it will be balancing different projects I'm working on, different deadlines, if I've got covers to do, if I've got sequential artwork to get in, if there's any illustration work that I've got to do. It's hard with the scheduling and, and trying to manage everything that I have to do. I've recently just hired an assistant to help me kind of with that. And it's already just changed my entire kind of working <laughs> schedule of just having somebody else to help plan that time. And John, happy I could be your assistant, happy to help. Yeah, thanks. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the other thing is I absolutely love working in that way and almost having a lack of routine because I work best under pressure and I work best when I don't have the time to think too much about things. So it's almost the opposite of Zach. We're both working a lot yeah. while Zach's kind of very controlled and has to plan out ahead and think about all these different kind of spinning plates. I'm just there and I've got to let the adrenaline kind of push what I do a little bit. And if I kind of plan things out too much and have a little bit of a more regiment of routine, then I don't work as well. I'll tend to flounder a little bit. Yeah, I thrive in the chaos, basically. <laughs> Organized chaos. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I told Pierre to be here at 3.30 and then he asked me like, oh, 3.30, right? I'm like, no, 3.30. 15. So. <laughs> I'm always late. I'm actually on John's schedule when it comes to work. I understand the living in madness, chaos, like that. That's definitely me. What was your first tech device that you just had to have? A laptop, a smartphone, a good one. or maybe like a Zune? I think Kyle had a Zune. Yeah, I remember I'm that. It. It's a very good one. I think for me, it would be the original iPods. I was always, like, especially for like road trips and everything like that, I'd always be listening to music and and then when the kind of like digitization of music became huge, I needed something straight away. I think I had, it was something like an iRiver or something like that beforehand. But then I can remember getting my first iPod and just being like, this is fucking amazing. So yeah, that was the first thing that I lusted after, I suppose. I think for me, kind of like one kid had it and everyone was like, oh my God, I need one of those was when the first Nintendo came out. I remember that being like a status it was like, oh my God, I need to have that one. And all the kids would be talking about going over to that kid's house to play on the Nintendo. And how do I get the Nintendo? So I feel like that was a bit of technology that was like screen time where you're just like, Poof you know, hours, you know, as a elementary school kid, just like, you know, gone. But I think also one that I didn't lust after getting, but that I remember once I had it feeling completely mind blown by the experience was for those of you who remember this getting AOL or Netscape CDs in the mail and logging on for the first time and realizing there were thousands of people online that you were just talking with. And it was just a crazy phenomenon. Like that was when the internet was first shared with everybody before, you know, it was this thing that no one 
knew about. And it was this very kind of like, here's a disc, put this in your computer. And now you're connected. It was such a fad, such a phase of like all the guys anyway. I'm sure there were girls too, but all the, all the boys were just like obsessed with just like exploring the internet. All my friends were when we found that. So, and we explored, we explored yeah. that internet. <laughs> I mean, it was lots of creepy stuff. It was lots of creepy stuff and crazy stuff. And like lots of dudes trying to flirt with each other probably and being like, you know, who's in this room and stuff. But I think it's just the concept of like, just like suddenly you were like, before the computer had been, I've been playing a couple of video games on it. And suddenly it was like, there were places to go with a lot, <laughs> a lot of sketchiness to them. <laughs> I remember growing up as a kid, the the moment I realized, I guess not smarter, but more advanced, I guess, with technology than my parents, just because she tried to put me in timeout and hide the cable to my computer. But I was like, this is the same cable for my PS1 or something like that, my Xbox at the time. So I would just switch the cable switch when she was not there. You know, When I was a kid and I got sent to my room, I think I had video games in my room or something. They had to amend that pretty quickly because it's like telling a kid to like go to his room. My room's loaded with technology, you know, like I can listen to music, I can play games. Games. You got to take the technology away. Go to the kitchen. That's where you send the kids. Don't send them to the room. Yeah. That's a great idea. I had World of Warcraft disc taken for a computer, so I didn't need the disc. So I just, you know, <laughs> continued to skip school and just play World of Warcraft all day. And and you could tell where the addiction kind of set in. All the technology just got us to do all these things. For sure. It's recommendations, books, comics, TV shows. What are you watching or what do you recommend, I guess? Just watch Beef. Talking about TV shows. Oh. Not what I expected at all starts off as one thing and then just drags you in and doesn't let go until the end it's like every episode just felt like a season finale like absolutely sensational it's kind of made me reassess storytelling in general I think it was yeah not seen anything like it in a long time yeah it was really good Steven Yoon I did The Last of Us that was a lot of fun that was pretty good I'm on Secession right now enjoying that I'm a, a, an episode behind or so but that's been really an amazing series I'm excited about the Dune trailer that dropped recently part two looks pretty amazing in terms of like comics I'm going to be doing a signing with two other creators on two amazing books Vault's Blue Flame by Chris Cantwell which is fantastic and Good Asian by Porn Sack which is an amazing amazing film noir book just so pulpy and history rich and character driven that one's great yeah i mean there's a lot of great comics out right now 20th century men dennis camps i think that comes out in graphic novel in a couple weeks that's fantastic too anything sci-fi is going to probably pull me in comics wise so like lee's in the uk where i live which is north of england for people that don't know where that is in the last couple of years there's been so many incredible creators that have moved to the city and they just keep swelling and swelling and the things that people are making are just absolutely fantastic so there's somebody called will morris who just did a series called gospel on image that was absolutely fantastic somebody called Gemma webster sharp who's working with fantagraphics she's in the now anthology does really bizarre surrealist kind of sexy bondage stuff i've not seen anything quite like it and somebody called anna redman who just done a self-published book called peach fuzz who is like one of the most talented cartoons I've ever seen. Amazing work coming out of everywhere you look in the city and it's just fantastic. I'm excited to see where a lot of the local creators end up next. I'll tell you one more that was really great recently is World Tree. I mean, James cannot seem to miss. Did you read World Tree yet, John? I've not read it yet. It's sick and twisted and really good. The first issue is one of the best issues I've read in a while. Who's it's that really, with? It's Image yeah, it's Book. Cool. James Tynan, Fernando Blanco, and I I think Jordi Belair is doing the colors and it's just about like this possessed presence in the technology that seems to be manifesting in partly associated with some crazy naked chick who's on all the covers, which is really cool. But then it's driving people to, to kill people. And then there's this kind of like sneakers sort of group of hackers from 20 years ago that has to reunite to put it all back together. It's just got a taste of everything. I was very envious of that setup. A clever mashup of sci-fi and horror and dark and yet adventure stuff. That was good. I anticipate that will be a big, big series. I need to check that out. I feel like James is the indisputable. Letting it down. King of the I know. first issue, like every first issue he uh, ever puts out, which feels like it's weekly at the minute. It's just like it's the best show. nonstop. Yeah, really. <laughs> to piggyback off that, tell us about your your smartphone app rotation. Like, what apps are you on mostly? Which ones do you most frequent? I'll look at Instagram for about five seconds, then I'll go to Facebook, Facebook Messenger, Twitter, and then just kind of rinse and repeat that all day. I just be there, like clicking on them, not even looking, and just like, oh. 
no updates cool <laughs> yeah i do my fair share sadly even though i wrote mindset of i'll do my fair share of doom scrolling instagram or tiktok and then i don't do facebook a lot i mean i'll i'll go on there to like post but i don't really doom scroll there i'll doom scroll twitter obviously to engage with people and you know people on twitter but yeah i'd say twitter instagram tiktok and you know a, a little texting here or there i have a couple productivity apps that i will be checking regularly like a few of the publishers and people that i work with are on slack or i use monday.com to kind of manage projects so that's kind of a way that i can like be on my phone and actually working but yeah i do my fair share i'm still waiting for my blue sky invite so if anyone's listening and has a blue sky invite i will happily take one of those i need to get on it's like the thing you know everyone's on blue sky now i have not heard of that to be honest jack dorsey's the twitter guy and then he sold twitter to elon and now mm -hmm. he's launching his new twitter i guess there was not a non-compete mm -hmm. clause so blue sky is, is the new twitter as far as i hear pretty much identical to twitter it just doesn't have elon it's right now in a beta version but it's this really interesting dynamic where it's invite only so you can either sign up on the wait list for blue sky and then they'll send you an invite when they're good and ready or if you're on it every week week you get an invite code that you can give to someone else and then they can get on which is creating a lot of like people asking for their blue sky invite codes so it's become a little bit of like a everyone's jonesing to get a blue sky invite because that's the only way to get on the social it's really kind of clever so yeah really so, yeah. i'm worthy of a blue sky yes. invite code <laughs> So if you're out there, yes, I'll send you a free mindset trade sign for my blue sky. <laughs> I will clip this perfectly. Isn't it crazy? Trade. Like I didn't even know about it and now I want it. You can't you have, you it. Want, you have it. Yeah, you, you want you it. You have it. Yeah. You can't have yeah. it unless someone who's inside opens the door and lets you in, basically. So now you need it. Yeah. I'm okay. in blue sky. You're in? You're in? No, no, no. No. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm barely in Twitter. I actually got hacked like two weeks ago. Oh, really? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I got my account back, but like for a while I was supporting some new cryptocurrency. It was like huh. shit coin. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, all right. Good. Yeah. I've heard that's good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Invest based on my check it out. account. Shit coin. All, all right. right. I'm on it. I'll look yeah. into it. <laughs> all right. Well, sticking to all of this fun stuff, how do we feel about checking? Chat GPT, AI art, is that it? On our way to Skynet, is this the beginning of the end? Well, we're going to actually have Chat GPT write Mindset too, and then AI oh. is going to draw it. So John and I get to sit back and sip some pina coladas and we don't have to work on it. So. I'd love that. I'd be all in on that. Let's do it. It's scary, <laughs> but I feel like you could do it. Now that it's actually the first issue's been written, now you just need to write something like this, draw something like this. <laughs> Better check our contracts again, make sure we're... Yeah, <laughs> it's a really complex issue i think for me it's hard to at the minute enter into meaningful conversations about it because we're still in that phase where everybody's having knee-jerk reactions of this is horrendous or this is the best thing ever and i think there's a lot more nuance than that for the art side especially ai art is horrendous and it kind of devalues the craft and the process and the thoughtfulness of it all but also there is the potential there for it to be a really interesting useful tool to streamline things like iterations or idea development. But until it has some level of regulation where it's not just ripping off artist styles and just trying to pass off things as original when they're not, then it's extremely questionable. But I think likewise for ChatGPT, I think there's a lot of potential good to be done for things like streamlining like the shit that we have to do that we hate doing like sending emails or like automated responses or right. and like for me like with kind of working in university things where it'll be repetitive feedback where you might be saying to students the exact same five things it has a potential to give a grounding for that that can then be developed and then be used as a tool to actually help people. So the artificial tool that's going to replace you, bad. The artificial tool that's going to replace me, super okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need a writer. <laughs> <laughs> And now you say you don't need an eye. So. I, I do. I do. You know, the sad thing is, I mean, these tools are not going anywhere. They're here to stay. My only hope is that we're in like a wild west right now because they've all like come out and like everyone's playing with them, exploring them, but there are no rules. It kind of reminds me when Napster was around and everyone just suddenly had access to MP3s 
everywhere. And there was no technology to really control or regulate that. Since then, that's not really the case anymore. I mean, people use places like, you know, Pandora and Spotify and things to play music. So the music industry had to change and adapt, but there became more systems to kind of protect artists and musicians in some way. My hope is that since these tools are not going anywhere, perhaps the industry, at least creative industries like comics will evolve to protect the people in them so that these tools are not so controversial. But the other hope I have is that fundamentally when readers are buying comics and in general, when readers are buying any books or any art or even watching movies and television or such, I do think that they're looking to connect with the creators directly. You know, there is something like you're at the airport, you want to read a book before you hop on the plane, you see Stephen King has a new book or something, you're going to get it because, you know, that's an author that you respect and you gravitate towards. And so people develop these kind of connections to creators. My hope is that because of that, creators therefore bring followings with them when they go to make art or make stories that from an economic standpoint, publishers will not be able to just say we had AI 22 and AI 45 write this thing and draw this thing because there's not that following that connection with the author's voice that's consistent over time is what people are gravitating toward. That's my hope anyway, but it's a crazy new landscape for sure. I know it's not going anywhere. I agree with that as well. I think the reason why we were so passionate about the things we like is it resonates with us and a lot of the time it's like human connection that human touch from the people that are making it and if you like a comic you want to see what that person's done more of or if you like a film you want to see what that director's done more of or an actor or anything and if you remove that then there's not really anything else left it's just kind of empty and soulless it might look good or it might read okay but it won't have that connection to an audience or to people and that's the important thing so i'm hopeful that it will take a place that will be beneficial to everybody but i think it will take time i agree completely i kind of been saying it like can ai make something yes but the word to use is generate it can't create it generates and that's just all there is to it. and i'll use it as a segue because mindset is just such a unique beautiful thing like the two of you on this together made such a perfect piece the story is just so relevant to the time that it's almost scary like it almost felt like a horror book and then the art i could not compare your art style to anything <laughs> so unique and fits the story so perfectly so yeah with that can we hear the elevator pitch for anyone who needs to pick up the trade when it comes out. Mindset is a David Fincher S sci-fi techno thriller about a bunch of grad students that accidentally discover a real form of mind control, a light and sound combination that can actually control people's minds with a simple suggestion. But they decide to do something differently with it. They put it in a meditation app to help free us of our addiction to technology. And then a billion people start using the app. They realize they're not helping people, but controlling them. And the whole story centers around this business start up that quickly falls into a murder mystery. Our main character is wanted for killing his investor. It opens with him in jail and he says, I didn't do it. It's all mind control. That's the elevator pitch. (laughs) Perfect. It's really great. Thank you. It's got to be up for some. Like you guys are nominated for this, right? In terms of awards, we don't know anything. We would absolutely be delighted. So so... I'm going to call it now. I don't see how at the minimum it's not nominated for Eisner. Like I don't see how it wouldn't be. Like especially as a whole. And I'm happy I didn't find it before it was given like in a trade format and i read it in one sitting because reading it all at once like i really feel like i took it in i think trade is the better way to read it we'll take that as a compliment (laughs) but we're not writing for awards all right i mean (laughs) uh, paging all eisner (laughs) voters we're purely trying to make art for art's sake i don't even think that john would accept an eisner would you john have you ever accepted an eisner (laughs) (laughs) you have have accepted an eisner okay so then never mind we do like awards Words. We'll take one. That's always a nice cherry and opportunity. But I think, you know, we poured our hearts into this book to make something that we were really passionate about from the very get go. We were super excited to try to play with the comics medium and form 
to just enhance the storytelling, enhance the narrative to really create a unique experience that, yeah, would stay with readers. And so it's really a joy to hear that it has. I think you're literally the first person that's given us feedback about reading it kind of all together. Because it's something we've spoken about before, the experience of reading it where you would have it monthly and then the gap between them and digesting it and talking about it compared to reading the whole thing start to finish. And it's, it's interesting that you really resonate with it, kind of reading the whole thing. It was great too, because I was like on like a weekend kind of trip. I got to like really absorb it. And like I was reading it outside and it's kind of ironic, I guess. <laughs> you were free. <laughs> the technological control. I mean, yeah. reading on my phone on full brightness, but yes. <laughs> what inspired the story? I write sci-fi, everything sci-fi. And so I definitely like to think about very classic, familiar science fiction tropes and topics, and then ask myself, what are the modern forms or playgrounds that might explore that. I came to mind control and I was thinking about mind control as a story type. And it's so funny because we have mind control in our society today. Our phones are controlling our minds. And not only that, but we're all completely aware of it and we accept it as just commonplace now. This shift that's taken place over the last decade where we went from not even having smartphones to being completely jovial about how addicted we all are to our phones and how disconnected we are to one another. And we laugh it off like frogs being boiled alive. And so in terms of a mind control story, I thought this is not something I've seen explored too much. I mean, there's a lot of stories that are exploring how our devices are controlling us and how we're addicted to technology, but actually creating app usage and phone usage as a metaphor for mind control. It just seemed to be really kind of fertile narrative area. And then as I got into it, it just kind of became this story about Silicon Valley and tech startup and our our protagonist, Ben Sharp, who's been raised on technology, who's idolized people like Bill Gates, who desperately wants to be part of that influence. And yet, because he feels outside, he is kind of also anxious to tear it all down and make his own mark. And it's a really kind of complex character story. And then, of course, he's given mind control. So it's what happens when good intentions take a turn. And how do you handle that You know, exponential rise into success? How do you handle influence? I mean, it's really a story about how we all covet influence, influencing each other. So it's not just about the technologies influence over us, but how we desperately want to feel influential. So it was all those things kind of come together. And then of course, dressed up in this business startup meets murder mystery thriller. Yeah, it was definitely a ride like from the beginning to the end, like almost like a Black Mirror episode. You know, I don't know if yeah. you ever watched that show, but oh yeah, yeah, it was like chilling. I'm like sitting there reading it using my phone and I'm just like, oh my God, like Instagram, all the different pages that you're on. Like, honestly, my fiance will tell me, she'll be like, oh, you use Facebook more than me. I was like, I never use Facebook. Meanwhile, I I turn, I'm like, wait, I'm on Facebook. Like, I, I <laughs> don't even realize that I go onto Facebook, like the app, I start scrolling. I don't know how I bounce to it. Yeah, no, this book was great for every aspect. So like, so that kind of came to me with the idea and the premise of it. But I think kind of as it developed and as our kind of relationship working together blossomed, the the kind of the level of inspiration just <laughs> skyrocketed. We kind of went into these lengthy conversations about what our intentions were, how the art and the storytelling would work work together or work against each other and it just kind of grew and grew i think for me the type of storytelling where you see and what you read like very very different things and it kind of catches you a little bit unawares so that was kind of one of the main things that going into it that i want to bring in with the artwork and something that we thankfully embraced <laughs> built upon i think that's one of the exciting things you know it was a story about control but it's a story about your perceptions right and so as this character is going through this experience and trying to figure out who's in control, the art does so much to just enhance that experience. And I think it offers a tremendous amount of re-readability. You know, you will want to go back and read it again, because you'll see that there are choices being made where characters in silhouette or the layouts that just kind of support a different experience. It's really more than just reading to understand the story. I think we're hoping that readers will be able to soak it in and actually say, wait a minute, there's the characters are in silhouette here, or this panel is literally breaking apart here.
here and there's a symbolic meaning to it. And with Hassan Osman El Hau, who's our amazing letterer, we really spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the artwork was not just telling the story, but offering its own influences as well. Yeah, the whole story is not only a reflection of the characters, but it's the intention the reader will reflect on what's happening and therefore their own interaction with technology. So the ideas of reflection are peppered throughout the story and the visuals and the narrative. Likewise, with themes of duality, not always being a black and white thing of technology is bad and this person is bad. It's like not like that. Like we were just talking about with AI, it's a lot of the time it's both things simultaneously is good and it is bad. So the themes of duality are something that we really tried to push and have come throughout the artwork as well. And yeah, the idea of the rereadability element we wanted that right from the get-go as well. There's stuff in the first issue where you get through to the end, it's like, oh my God, it was in the first issue. And a lot of people will probably miss that. But when you go back to read it again, hopefully you will have a completely different experience. And then it goes into that kind of reflective loop of what you're seeing and what you're reading and what you're believing and what you're choosing to see, the selective nature of it all. Yeah, it was important for us to make it kind of a little more complex as a story so that you are not only unsure of what's going to happen next from like a thriller standpoint, but you're also not sure what you're supposed to feel like. You know, you start with this character who's on the outside. Ben is looking to get in to be a part of this world to rise and his success. And you're saying, you know, yeah, we wish he could have a shot. And then he gets that shot and you're not sure that it's going the way you want it to go. I mean, you're not sure if, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure. I, am I rooting for him to continue to be successful? This is not going well. And so I think that there's a lot of mixed feelings that are intended. I think create a kind of complex read that makes you unsure, which is what we all feel about our relationship with technology and social media anyway. We're relying on it. It's a part of our lives. And yet we have mixed feelings about it. What was it like working with one another? It's awful. Hey, um... <laughs> so oh, yeah. Glad it's over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Especially with the time zones. You guys are a little far away. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. John's in London. Thank God for technology to bring us together, right? Fantastic working with Zach. Um, the collaboration on this book, we always wanted it to be something where we closely collaborated on it. And then as we got into it and we started having more and more conversations, we just became kind of entwined into each of the processes and it was superb. So at the very start, like I said, Zach came to me kind of saying, oh, do you want to work on something? And then had the idea for mindset. And then as we got into it, we kind of slowly progressed to having more and more calls and conversations about what we wanted to do, our intentions. And then Zach would start to kind of call me before he'd even written the script, kind of with the outline, the ideas, asking my opinion, asking kind of how I thought it kind of worked in the larger narrative, how it might work with the artwork. And then likewise, Zach would have ideas for the artwork of what he thought was really good after he got used to seeing how I worked and how I presented things and some of the, the kind of themes and the imagery that would be popping up and recurring until it was just something where it was a true collaboration and I think that's a really rare thing for any creative person is to have a, a collaboration that I think is this closely knitted and hopefully that shows in the book as well. It's a real labor of love and it's something that I think both of us have really poured into equally. Yeah, I think in terms of my collaboration with John, we both had a very strong shared vision. We both really wanted to make something that was meaningful and thoughtful and we really knew those touchstones and so as we embarked on that journey, we had a sense of direction. So we were really free to get really geeky and really thoughtful about every single choice that we were making. And we would go to great lengths to kind of analyze and question at any point, what could bring this narrative further? What could elevate it even more in both directions in terms of me talking about cool layout ideas to even me sharing the shape of a narrative on an issue with John before I'd even written the script just to get him to be able to weigh in both on the narrative implications and then in turn how that might come out in the art you know hey this is a sequence do you think that this sequence needs x pages or y pages i want to emphasize this emotion he'd say well what about this aspect of it oh 
that's even better. Let me go back and write that now with your perspective in mind. So it was really about just creating this back and forth loop. And again, it came from us both being really driven in the same direction on the story. Yeah, yeah I think that relationship really shows in your writing and the art because again, as I followed it as a ride, not only was it the writing that kept me on that ride, but the art, like I literally felt myself going through the pages and just kind of following the story through its twists and turns. So it was a very awesome seeing that and relationship I, flourish. Thank you. I'll tell you a huge shout out to our letterer, Hassan Asmain Alha, who's one of the best letterers right now in the entire business. The narrative can be, you know, a lot to take in at times because you have been narrating in a very kind of dramatic way. And then you have these beautiful pages that have all sorts of texture and nuance. And to be able to weave letters across these pages, and sometimes a lot of, of word balloons in a way that makes it effortless and easy to read and directs your eye just through the book at a fast pace is an artwork in and of itself. And so he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for the quality of the read. Yeah, yeah like Hath is just sensational at working tirelessly to come up with something that is sympathetic to the artwork as well. I mean, my style isn't always the most kind of commonplace, I suppose. If you had something that was more of a standardized approach to the lettering, then that'd be a little bit jarring in places. So Hass, he did a lot of tests to see what would work, what we liked, what would kind of work with the artwork. Like all of the word balloons are just hand-drawn, everything. Hand-drawn, hand-drawn. Yeah. On the kind of mind control, zaps the glitchy stuff. So he did all of the kind of sound wave stuff that again, blends into the artwork that probably would have thought that I'd do that. So he's just unbelievable. The Love balloons it. are changing color scene to scene. <laughs> yeah. There's not a consistent color. And then the background of the balloons is a little translucent, which gives you this kind of feeling of there's more to it or kind of you're looking through at something, which is this kind of reflective experience, which is obviously connected to the book. And this, again, all comes from at the onset being able to say, what are we trying to say with this book? And how can we bring every facet of it up to a level that provokes thought? So is there anything differently that you did with either your writing or your art? Obviously, you know, talking about how the relationship is built within it, but just anything that you had to do or change for this? For me, one thing that I started to do about halfway through the series was actually consult with John before writing the scripts about the shape of the script to seeing the layout choices that we were making. We were creating patterns throughout the series. And I recognized that it was more important for me to get input about what might want to be a double page splash or what might want to be a fast nine panel grid. So I would then come to him and that's not something I've done on any other series, but I would say, okay, issue three or issue four, here's the shape of here's the narrative. And I'm thinking this is the page breakdown and to get that feedback. So it just created an additional level of collaboration and gave me the chance to actually write towards the artistic choices that he wanted to make. Like we said before, it's the collaboration is so close that I think my approach to the artwork on mindset, it wasn't just, I've got a script, I'm going to draw it. It was how is this going to work best, not only for the story, but knowing his intentions, how is the best kind of interpretation of that factoring in my vision as well? How can I best kind of present that? So it absolutely changed how I approach the artwork and something that I think after mindset as well, kind of moving forward with the other work that I'm doing is something that I'm striving for more now is I always like kind of close collaborations and how it influences the artwork. But I think the experience with Zach and my mindset has like fundamentally changed my perspective on how I work and yeah for the better this in my eye a little bit I'm fine trust me <laughs> <laughs> If someone would have told me like one person created it, the collaborations really that seamless. Like it would have been wild for one person to have done all yeah. of that. Like, it would have yeah. taken the last <laughs> 10 years. But... <laughs> there are one creator books out there that where one creator writes and draws them all. It has one central voice. So there's more than one voice here for sure. John's voice and my voice and Haas's voice all kind of marry together. So yeah, yeah I definitely. appreciate that. John, can you give us a little bit of insight into your drawing process? Because every scene looks like it could be a print. 
Thank you. I have a few screenshots on my phone that I want to, you know, keep. Fantastic. That's lovely to hear. So the process for this was, again, slightly different to how I work intentionally. So so from the outset, I wanted the artwork to reflect the story, but also the process to reflect the story. So we have a narrative where kind of main character is this unreliable narrator, really, where you're questioning what you read and you're questioning a lot of the actions. And I wanted the artwork to reflect that as well. So the approach to it is a combination of traditional approaches and digital and blending of them. So you can't quite tell what's done traditionally and what's quite done digitally. So I'll do a lot of digital layouts and then I will do traditional pencils. Then that would be scanned in. And then I worked with a flatter. Jimmy Savage was fantastic. And then he would flat a lot of it. And then I would work that out digitally. And then it would be printed out onto G clays and then painted on top of and then scanned back in and then kind of finished digitally as well. So it's this idea of what you're seeing where's the level of truth in it as well in the process of it so there's bits of it where it will probably look more traditional than others but a lot of those bits are probably actually more digital than traditional <laughs> so yeah a real fun process probably a little bit too lengthy and involved basically <laughs> but yeah i absolutely loved it and i think like when i look at the pages and the work that was done as well it's trying to capture this painterly atmospheric like Virgin into almost like abstraction, like thinking about colors, thinking about the moods and emotions that it's going to evoke from the reader, but also then going into something that is almost photorealistic and very crisp and precise. So again, thinking about the narrative and how it's reflected, the sliding scale of things that are in some cases literally photographed to then things that are just pure shape and color and abstraction. Where in that field does the artwork lay in comparison to the narrative? And how does it make what you're seeing, kind of what emotions does it evoke? How does it make you feel? And also, where's the believability and actually how it's been made? So, yeah, I had an absolute blast doing it. Yeah, it was very, very good fun. <laughs> Holy shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way, crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. So cool, though. No, that just sounds crazy, like how much went into it, like the layering and all of it. And it really does go with the story because one of them was like, I'm sure it had to do with the lettering, too. There's like a red background and he's just walking. It's almost like this kind of like delirium sets in and he has no idea. It's like, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. When he's in jail as well, there's a sequence where he's... Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of repeat imagery and kind of symbols throughout. So that's the good thing as well. And I'm glad that's resonated with you because it's things like that and the repetition of the use of those images and those techniques that will get you again questioning why is this being used again and, and why is that reflective of what situation this character's in. So yeah, things like the use of silhouettes, things like the repetition of people walking, things like reflections, things just kind of degrading into nothingness. The use of water, the character seeing his own reflection the device of ben being in the front and center of the page of a double page spread again and again but in yeah. different ways in different contexts the characters literally being outside of the panel borders looking in yeah all sorts of stuff but again me and zach we spoke about it a lot at every stage and this is what we wanted to pour in again for that rereadability so hopefully it's got that impact when you first read it's like wow this is great and it looks really good and then when you read it again you'll pick up on these little nuances and little details that will slowly shift and alter your experience of it it's really excellent thank you one of my favorite things it's issue three where the whole page goes in a circle so like the words and you can just keep going and you could start at any point within that how did you come up with that there's a point in issue three where the characters have mind control but they realize that the mind control is currently single use and they decide to raise the stakes by putting mind control on someone's phone where it will not only control them but tell them to come back to be controlled again and sort of a repeat imprint and this loop of influence, we decided to reflect on the page in an actual loop. The characters refer to it as a loop, and they're talking about the ways in which they're going to not only loop a character by making them always check their phones, but the very nature of how this sort of advertising, it's been in advertising, it's been in kind of our society for a while. And now with the use of our phones, it's easier than ever just to make us come back again and again. And so we decided to reflect this in kind of a, a series of panels that 
that does not start or finish, but just kind of goes in a circle. You know, I think I shared the idea with John and he built on it from an aesthetic standpoint to be visually what you see. And then we wrote the dialogue so that the dialogue would also not have a start or stop point. So you can find a start in, but you really quickly realize it has no beginning or end, which makes the loop all that more powerful and horrific at the same time. It's like I remember when Zach kind of came up with that idea and he was like, yeah, we're going to do this and it's going to loop and it's going to kind of be in the circle. And I was like, fuck yeah, that sounds great. Because I think originally we were kind of toying with the idea of like having him again kind of walking around but i really like the idea of him just being in the same pose and again repeating and it's almost like he's not changing it's just the stuff around him that's changing and again it's like we were saying earlier oh yeah I'm never on facebook and then it's like i'm on it now like and you don't even know it's like the world around you is changing and you're just still looking at your phone yeah i really like that idea and that approach to it but yeah that's a great page and then again has coming in and just absolutely nailing the lettering to make it just seamless, seamless. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine just a voiceover like five hours later and you're <laughs> still going. Like, you're like, I can't get out of this loop. <laughs> like, I, that was the moment that I knew with this book. I was like, I'm fucked. Very, very good. That was my favorite part, personally. Thank so. you. I have that page screenshotted for sure. It's so cool. <laughs> so, Zach, with the ending, which obviously not to spoil, it's a little bit of a twist, you might say. How far in advance did you kind of have that plan to kind of play out that way? Mindset is a mind control thriller. There's no surprise <laughs> that it is a big who is controlling who mm -hmm. and there's some twists and turns and absolutely from the very onset we had this massive twist in mind that takes place later in the story and definitely wanted to surprise readers and also make total sense when they see it we don't want to spoil anyone's experience but it was something that we worked on from the onset and again in the same thoughtful way not only do we plan it from a narrative standpoint but i think if you go back and reread the graphic novel again and again you'll find that the art is also completely supporting this twist so it's something that brings that joy of oh my god but at the same time ah it was there all along in some ways and so it, you know that's the fun part of writing a mind control thriller yeah the first issue very much it has imagery in that if you just read the first one skip the last one and be like oh okay cool yeah the visuals support it explicitly. <laughs> Reread it again. <laughs> I'll definitely be checking that again. So given the power to mind control, what would you do? God. Um, graphic novel. <laughs> yeah, given the power to mind control. Yeah. There's an extra layer to this question because this will be on the internet eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, given the power to mind control, I don't know that I would. Pretty scary power for me. I feel like it's one of those powers that is intrinsically linked to horror. It's not like I can fly or or even reading minds, I feel like the ability to make people do what you want to do, it's just an area that I probably would not be comfortable going down. I'm, obviously, there are moments in life where you wish you had that for a brief moment. But in the grand scheme of thing, I think, especially after writing this book, I have the ability to say that it's just something I would say pass. Yeah, exactly the same. I think for mind control or kind of controlling other people, it always draws a lot of parallels for me personally with ideas of manipulation or power imbalance. And I think for me personally as well, I'm much more of a submissive person. I'm the guy that people would control probably, like rather than somebody that would control somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an idea that I would find extremely hard to think of, like something that I would control and what I would do outside of something that was a bit more farcical and just funny really but like yeah i think like in a seriously it would be something that would be outside of my remit if i did have mind control there's really only one thing that i would be comfortable controlling everyone to do and that is to go pick up vault comics <laughs> mindset graphic novel coming soon to stores everywhere that i feel good about that sort of control you know that's something that's just going to be a positive impact on everybody so yeah there's no downside to making people want to buy this book yeah i would enslave the world uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd make them make me a giant throne and i would be your fearless leader small thinking fear. okay yeah i would, I would bow down, down. <laughs> <laughs> yes creative thinking but world hey domination. Listen, listen if you just want people to read your book no problem i'll make that happen deal we're in agreement <laughs> you can have world domination i'll have everyone read mindset <laughs> 
tell us about your experience publishing through Vault. Yeah, it's been a wonderful experience publishing with Vault. We brought Vault this idea and immediately they were all in. They jumped on board. They fully saw the vision. They were super excited about it. I think it was something that fit into their sci-fi fantasy landscape, but it was something that was a little bit different for them in an exciting way. And from the very get-go, from editorial with their EIC, Adrian Wassel and Dershing Helmer, who came on board to their amazing marketing team, David Disanayak and Daniel Crary and Sydney, their amazing book retailer representative. And yeah, at every point, they've got stellar, passionate people working tirelessly for them. And they really get out and help push the book, share their love of it. And it's been a great experience. Yeah, it's been just sensational from start to end, really. I think for me, it's always taken me back whenever you're, you're talking to any member of the team and they're just genuinely enthused by what we're doing and it's not something that they just have to put a front on and because it's their job they're just really into it and that's kind of come through as well I think with the support they've given us and how much they pushed the book I mean when that first issue came out a lot of people were just saying to me like they couldn't book anywhere and not see something related to mindset because they just really pushed the advertising and marketing so hard and then likewise doing things with them New York last year I was doing live painting with them there's a competition winner a recreation of the issue one cover with their face on it and yeah they've just been absolutely sensational and i can't speak any higher of them it's a great company yeah so we joked about ai creating mindset too earlier can we expect <laughs> more out of you guys that wasn't a joke that was <laughs> <laughs> word no i think you know for now anyway it's a pretty contained experience you know we were really excited to create the kind of binge worthy monthly mini series and now we've got this graphic novel that collects into a great experience because you can read it all at once and then read it again and again. And we've talked about our excitement for people to have the chance to go back and forth. And it is a pretty contained journey right now. I mean, never say never to these things, but I think our excitement lies in creating new stories as we move forward and, and just letting Mindset have its moment here as a standalone miniseries. I mean, obviously Mindset deals with ideas of, of control and technology around us. And being as that's something that is continually evolving at a rapid rate, then even though what we've done is very much self-contained, then who knows what happens in the future. I mean, it's hard enough to predict technological advances at the minute. So maybe in a few years' time, there'll be something equally as controlling and another conversation for us to have with readers about it. But who knows what will happen. That's the exciting thing about, for us, mindset, because it really captures a conversation that's going on right now about technology and our devices. That situation is going to age and change just in the next few years. It's going to be a completely different conversation. So obviously, we could revisit mindset in new conversations. But at the same time, it's so perfect for right now about our relationships with our devices and with one another and this kind of culture of influence and technological control that we're all aware of and yet uncomfortable by. Yeah, one would say the current mindset. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I hate to agree, but as cool as a sequel would be, it's just good the way it is. It's like one of, you know, there's comics like that where it's like, just leave it be. And then they never don't. say never, but yeah, it's pretty tight. As it We'll trust you either way. I mean, when we started off, we didn't intend it to be more than a self-contained thing, but let's see what happens. Let's see if we win any eyesness for it. <laughs> I'm putting my bets on it. <laughs> Take it. Uh, final plug, release date. You know, I'll tell everyone to go buy it, which I think we said a few times, but let's do it again. But yeah, the collected Mindset graphic novel, all six issues from Vault Comics, will be out June 7th in comic shops and bookstores everywhere from myself, John Pearson, Hassan Asmain Elhow. Go check it out. Where can everyone follow you? I'm on the internet, of course. Technology rules. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and hopefully Blue Sky someday soon. Caps. <laughs> and I have a Substack newsletter that I occasionally dabble in. It's called Technobabble. Definitely, if you want to see some of my stuff when I have new comics coming out soon, get on that. Subscribe to that. Yeah, you can find me Instagram, Twitter, the various social media places. It's always at John J. Pearson. That's where I'm at, wherever you may find me. But yeah, Instagram's the main place that I'll be active. So yeah, another look at stuff. Where can we buy art for this book? You can buy art for this book 
book in the near future from Cadence Comic Art. So Cadence, mm. nice. they represent me and sell my original artwork. But yeah, there's not actually been any artwork from Mindset that's gone on sale yet. There was one person in New York who asked about it and I had some stuff there who bought a page. Other than that, that has got a couple I've claimed things, a few. You know, I've yeah, claimed but, a few uh, as <laughs> I have the right to firstborn children and such. <laughs> uh, as you should. There uh, are a number, page? there are too many. I cannot claim them all and there are plenty of uh, tributes there. So uh, yes, I gotta know which pages you claimed. You got the cover for issue one. Got the cover for issue one. Did I get the falling off the boat four and five? Yeah, they're the only two that I know for sure. I can't remember if there's any other ones we got, but I know those two. Uh, Did someone buy the shock page? That's the one from New York. Yeah, that was painful. I was standing right next to that. I could have been like, I'm taking it, but I was like, oh no, go ahead and take <laughs> it. Which one you right. that? And then I was like, no, Zach's having this one. Zach's having this one. I think you're like, I can't. Yeah, you can sell it. Right, take it. <laughs> yeah. There's so many good ones. And then just in the later, that pinwheel, the loop one's available. That one will probably go yeah. for sure. There's just so many good um, ones. But yeah, they'll be available at some point in the future. But yeah, follow Cadence for more information on that. All right. Any other projects you want to mention that you're working on? Anything like that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All secret stuff, sadly, at this point. I can't announce Damn. anything new. I'm just in the cave working on out. So uh, okay. soon, but not yet. Yeah. yeah. Likewise, like nothing <laughs> I can talk about. Working on stuff. That's, okay. That's about it. Yeah. When you can talk about it, obviously, you know who to reach out to. Awesome. You know, it's uh, a given. But just wanted to thank you both. Again, love the book. We Waiting to Thank see it win guys. something. It's going to win something. But just thanks again. And thanks for making this, honestly. It's such a unique piece. Like, I can't wait to have it on my shelf. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that means a lot. Yeah, thanks for the kind words. Yeah, it does. And Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay. Come on and just... No, Thank you. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I do use AI to fix Dimitri's microphone. Just appropriate for all of this. Mindset. Obviously, we're super casual. Feel free to say fuck as many times as you want. It's all good. Fuck, 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 fuck. We're just putting it on the words. Any ones you feel like. Actually, interesting story with that. My mom today said that you curse a lot, Kyle. She said not to tell you, but she was very happy that I don't curse. I'm sorry. Mindset. Recommendations. Books, comics, TVs. TVs. And yeah. TVs, tell us your favorite <laughs> Samsung. <laughs> favorite TVs? I like Samsung. Yeah, Samsung. Yeah. I have a Q70, a Q60 is a good one. Yeah. Uh, Black yeah. frame, you got to get a flat mount. Kyle's really good at it. Oh, yeah, really? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm talking about the holes in the wall. The TOC models were cool back in the day. They have like a little touch of red. I used to work at Best Buy and we used to sell a lot of them, so. <laughs> right. you really got into it. I really got into it. I remember model numbers and everything. Wow. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be with so you forever. Be Mindset. I'm on 11 percent. 11 percent. We're good. We're fine. I'm 11 percent. We're good. Yeah, my phone's about to die. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be at like a sliver. Like, what is this? Like, oh, five percent. Yeah. I got power save on and everything. Mindset. Dogs are barking. That is my dog. Yeah. Oh, is that, is that oh, okay. you have to go? No, because huh? my dogs are barking too. So I'm like, wait. My dog like, is talking to your dogs. <laughs> I bet you that. 